Hello and welcome to our program, Where God Weeps, a program where we talk about the situation of the suffering church around the world. Mongolia, which is about the size of Alaska, has a population of 2.8 million, of which approximately 80% practice Tibetan Buddhism. Christians number only 2%. Mongolia is encircled by China and Russia. It was the Russians who originally helped the Mongolians to drive out their Chinese rulers, but who then stayed on to control the state for another 70 years. The communist regime tried all they could to wipe out any sign of religion from society. In this landlocked country, dominated by sparsely populated steppe and semi-desert, however, the church today has found fertile ground for evangelization. From a Christian population of zero, Bishop Padilla, the Bishop of Mongolia, has seen Catholicism take root and blossom, growing to approximately 900 persons, with 50 or more Mongolians preparing each year for baptism. The church is new, says Bishop Padilla. He calls it an infant church, a baby church. To tell us more about the story of the church in Mongolia, it is my great pleasure to welcome Bishop Venislao Spadilla, the Bishop of the Apostolic Prefecture of Mongolia. Your Excellency, thank you for being here with us today on our program. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Your Excellency, yes. to the situation when you first arrived in 1992, you came, you were alone with two other priests or three other priests, I think you started with, and you had nothing. What was it like? It felt a bit like the first apostles evangelizing to a people who had no knowledge of Jesus Christ. Yeah, indeed we had to start from uh, scratch, no? from zero really. Uh, we had nobody to welcome us as uh, Christians to welcome us. We had no uh, building to go through, to go to. Where would you, stay? for example, celebrate mass? Where were, what were you, where were you housed? Uh, the first masses that we had celebrated were in the hotel, the Ulaanbaatar Hotel, mm. and then when we found uh, these apartments uh, built by the Russians, mm. uh, we started re renting them, and we had our first liturgical celebrations in those. Uh, rented apartments. What was this time like? It must have been, as I, as I mentioned, I think it must have been like the first apostles. How did you, how were you received by the people? Well, uh, it didn't know that uh, we are uh, Catholic priests, no? but slowly uh, through our contacts with the, the foreign community, uh, those uh, working in international organizations or in embassies, uh, we started uh, celebrating the Eucharist with them, and after some time, these uh, people from the expat communities, uh, they started inviting their own workers, okay. Mongolian workers or personnel, yeah. Establishing the Catholic faith in Mongolia, did it, did it take off like a wildfire, or did it take some time for the, for the ground to be prepared? Well, it, it was a very slow start, mm. because we ourselves, the three uh, missionaries, mm of the CICM, Congregatio Immaculate Cordis Marie. Uh, we didn't know how to start, but uh, we encourage ourselves by saying, come and see. Mm. So the people come and see, and then we associate with them, we talk with them, we try to uh, let them understand our purpose in being there, because uh, they have been questioning us, why are you here? What, what, what for are you here? Mm. So it's a very slow start, as I said. But there were Christians before you came in 1992. There was yes. a history of Christian mission already in Mongolia. What was this history? I think in the uh, 13th century, uh, there have been exchanges between the emperor and uh, the Holy See and with the Holy Father and then. But uh, these things uh, have not uh, lasted because uh, this uh, people from the Vatican or the Holy See, they were just emissaries bringing uh, letters of the Holy Father to the Emperor. And 
Likewise, the Emperor of Mongolia was also sending uh, letters through emissaries. No? But uh, there have been uh, attempts to stay in uh, Mongolia, but it never worked out. So it never took root? Yes, but in 1921, uh, there was an attempt to establish already uh, Mishu Suviuris, an independent mission. Uh, and some of my confreres who were in China were mm, earmarked to start the mission in Outer Mongolia, but it never worked it out. It never worked. Yeah, but uh, when we arrived there, there were already two years of activity by the Christian or the Protestant missionaries. So they were ahead two years okay. of us. Okay. Yes. And, and uh, how are the relations with the Protestant communities now? If I understand correctly, there are some 200 different Protestant churches active in Mongolia. How are the relations between yourself and the Protestant communities? Well, uh, we maintain cordial, uh, friendly relations mm -hmm. with them. We never have uh, arguments with them, uh, but uh, we are friendly ah, to good. each one. And uh, with the other uh, religious communities also, we try to do the same. To, and, keep, uh, to keep the dialogue. Uh, yes, to keep the dialogue and to know each other. And it works, especially on uh, every September 21, uh, we have this International Day of Peace. Mm. And uh, we invite those uh, church organizations or communities to join in the prayers for peace for the world, no? Your Excellency, you come from the Philippines. How did you make it from the Philippines all the way to, to Mongolia? What brought you personally to Mongolia? Well, uh, as a missionary of the uh, CICN, yeah. Scoot Missionaries right. of Belgium, yeah. uh, we are sent to other places, not our own countries. Mm -hmm. So I was first in Taiwan for 15 years before I went to Mongolia. So uh, as the uh, Russians left Mongolia, the Mongolian government uh, wanted to have diplomatic relations with the Vatican. Because at the time when they were left alone by yes. uh, the foreign, uh, what do you call this, mm -hmm. uh, powers, mm -hmm. first by China and then afterwards uh, by Russia, by Russia uh, they wanted to have diplomatic relations with other countries. And it so happens that the uh, Vatican is one of their choices choice uh, city state or country you no know, right. because they know that the uh, Vatican has uh, an international uh, influence mm -hmm. you no know? so they were thinking that maybe by having diplomatic relations with the Vatican mm -hmm. uh, they will be uh, faster in connecting with other countries in the international community yes in the international community you said once that your father was an example for you for your vocation how was your father an example for you in your missionary life? Well, uh, I was a small boy when I found out that my father is uh, a catechist, uh, a religious educator of the CICM in the mountain provinces. So we have been following my father wherever he, uh, he was assigned. No? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, it has uh, some influence on me in my growing up mm -hmm. to, yeah, to admire the foreign missionaries like the Belgians. No? He must have been proud when he, you, he came to know of your vocation and your priesthood. Yes, in fact, he, he, he asked me to uh, be free in deciding, but my mother was more intent on uh, having me as a, a missionary or a priest. About 80% of uh, Mongolia's 2.8 million follow Tibetan Buddhism. Yes. How did Tibetan Buddhism, first of all, come to Mongolia, and then secondly, um, are they open for for evangelization? Is there is there a willingness? Is there a reception um, to the Christian message? I think the Tibetan Bod Buddhists started their uh, mission in Mongolia uh, still the seventh century, I think. So uh, it's not really a traditional or a national uh, a religion. Mm -hmm. uh, it came also from India. Right. So. Uh, with the government uh, insisting on this as their national religion, uh, the people had to uh, join in. And uh, I it's very amazing well, how these people, uh, practicing or not, I don't know, uh, that they are receptive to any kind of religion, especially after uh, they're being uh, 
released from the communistic uh, rule. No, mm -hmm. so seemingly, I think uh, during the uh, communist regime, there was a spiritual vacuum. There have been persecutions, cultural uh, persecutions, no? but. Uh, uh, the people then somewhat have uh, a spiritual vacuum, mm -hmm. and uh, when they were uh, liberated somewhat mm -hmm. from this uh, grip of communism, they started uh, catering to any kind of uh, idea or any kind of new thing that uh, entered Mongolia. Yeah. So they are receptive. How would you say, do you still see the scars of communism on the hearts of the people today? And if so, how is this manifest? It is diminishing, uh, although uh, some of the government officials are still uh, maybe complying to uh, what uh, they learned from communism at the time. So, But uh, among the general population, as you say, it's diminishing. There's a, a greater openness to something else and, and I suppose to, to, the, to Western values or what, what values would they be looking towards? I think uh, the Mongolians would uh, like to identify themselves better with the European values. No? Mm -hmm. So there is uh, an openness to what is happening in the, uh, in the world. And they are very uh, also very open to any kind of new things uh, happening in their lives, especially fashion or those technologies. Mm -hmm. Or yeah, they are very receptive to that. They're taking it on quickly. Yes, Your Excellency. There are now in the 22 years that you've been there a community of 900 Catholics that have grown, mm -hmm. with over 71 missionaries, of which 20 religious priests. Um, has this surprised you? And what sign of hope is this for you, for the Mongolian community and, the, and, and Mongolia? Yeah, I really uh, depend on the uh, dedication and the commitment of uh, my missionaries, mm -hmm. 71 strong, mm -hmm. and uh, with 20 priests and uh, two brothers, and the rest are nuns or sisters. Uh, without them, I think uh, the mission will not move on. Mm -hmm. So with their dedication to their work, uh, the, the mission is going on. And would your focus now be on catechists, on lay laity like your father was? Is that where you see that the future of spreading the gospel is? I think it's only one of the aspects of evangelization. Mm -hmm. And uh, I emphasize that evangelization has to take place in any aspect of uh, society's life. No? in the society. Mm -hmm. So whatever we are doing, either we are doing social work, developmental work, education work, or charitable humanitarian work, mm -hmm. we find ourselves evangelizing. Mm -hmm. So it is very important for, for us that uh, we have to be active in all the facets of uh, the Mongolian society. I want to come to the question of the social work of the church a little bit later on, but just one question I would have because the Catholic community has been growing very strongly up to 900 as we've mentioned, but at the same time, 20% uh, of those that have converted to the Catholic faith have subsequently left the church. Is this unusual? Why and, and for what reason uh, have this 20% left the church? I think it's uh a useful thing uh, that happens in any kind of uh, Christian community, even what we have in the Philippines. No? Mm -hmm. Because uh, I think because of the influence of, uh, outside influence of different uh, circumstances that are happening in Mongolia at the present time. For example? So from a nomadic form of existence, uh, the people are now catering to live in the city, mm -hmm. cities, and then uh, they find our, their, themselves sometimes very much confused or uh, don't find uh, a belonging. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, because of the uh, entry of uh, uh, market economy, uh, the people uh, are becoming more materialistic, well, materialistic. and consumerist mm -hmm. in their attitude. No? And especially now, uh, Mongolia is uh, undergoing a transition, I will say a transition, okay. wherein uh, from the nomadic form of existence, they are going to a civilized uh, way of living. They are more open to other countries and to the Western influence. No. In fact, you mentioned, I think in an interview, you were quoted as saying that you felt it was important for the people to, to move from this nomadic lifestyle to a more sedentary uh, life or civilization. 
why do you see this importance of, uh, of, of, let's say, the movement away from the nomadic lifestyle? Well, I think uh, the nomadic lifestyle is uh, a very difficult life, no? Just imagine uh, every year, six months, uh, you, have, uh, you are in the cold, no? And it's difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a democratic country, with this new democracy that uh, uh, the, the people are clinging to, mm -hmm. uh, I think they have to adjust themselves to the other democratic uh, countries, no? the okay. people there. So I think it's good for them. To it's better for the civilization. As yeah, a, the civilization. I want to come back to the question of, of materialism and particularly for the young people. I think that in many regards, uh, Mongolia is, is experiencing a very rapid transition from, as we know of this nomadic, nomadic culture uh, and, and herding culture mm. to uh, the the life in the cities with all of the new technology that's available. How do you work? How do you try and educate the youth to all of this new globalization and perhaps secular values and perhaps materialism? How do you educate these young people to be able to manage these new challenges? Well, uh, that is the big challenge that we are having now. That's why uh, I believe that uh, to have an impact on the society uh, to have an, uh, the the most important thing that we we have to address is uh, the education of the youth. So that's how I came to uh, uh, think of establishing uh, schools. No, mm -hmm. and uh, luckily I think that the missionaries are also in this. Uh, now, uh, in, in, idea. In, in fact, you've started the first uh, Catholic elementary school, I think, yes. in September of, of 2013. Yes. Was the, it's the largest. I think uh, you mentioned earlier that there were some smaller initiatives. There were religious sisters running some small. But this is really a large government-approved Catholic school, elementary school, yes. with 160 students, is that correct? No, uh, it's around 85, uh, 85. students at the moment. But uh, if we will uh, make it into full use, maybe we can, we can cater to 250, 300 uh, youngsters. Now, why is this such an important milestone, this, this uh, school, in terms of your relations with the government and in society? Yeah, uh, the government uh, is itself uh, going into this direction that uh, the, the people need to be educated. No? Uh, the president is very strong on the education of children, no? because now the uh, biggest part of the population of Mongolia is uh, children and the youth. No? So uh, we have to be carried with the, with the trend of uh, the times, especially in the society, if they need education, so the church must be present also in this kind of apostolate. And the government is, is looking favorably at the church as one area, one resource for education. I hope that uh, they will look on the, the contribution of the Catholic Church as a good contribution to the society because, uh, yeah, uh, there are still restrictions that they are placing on church organizations mm. or on religions. But hopefully through the good example, these will, with time, fall away. Yes, I hope so. Your Excellency, also with the question of street children, in Ulaanbaatar, for example, there are a, a great number of street children, sadly, and the church has been very active. In fact, your own missionary community has been very active in yes. working with these street children and making a home. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, why are street children so prevalent in, in Ulaanbaatar? And, and uh, again, is there space given by the government to the church to start to expand these kind of social activities? Yes, uh, at the very beginning, uh, the need was there. Uh, there were so many children who were uh, running away from home and they go to the streets, especially those coming from the countryside, because of the difficulty of uh, living there in the countryside, because of poverty. And also, uh, just to come back, is this nomadic lifestyle, is it something that the people was this also an impact or was it simply the poverty that was driving the young people to the cities? Yes, at the very beginning it was like that, but uh, times have changed at the present time when the government started taking also their responsibility towards the youth, no? So they started uh, doing something about this mm -hmm. and uh, giving, for instance, uh, subsidies to the families so that the, the children could go to school. Mm -hmm. So less and less um, uh, street children are found in the streets. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are still people, older, the adults, no? Older people who are uh, found in the streets 
who are collecting in the garbages right. uh, of uh, people. Because previously, of previously the society, if I understand correctly, the society would have looked after the the community would have looked after the elderly. Is this again a new phenomenon, or is this something that has tragically been here throughout the history of the of the country? This this let's say the the fact that the community is not looking after its elderly. Yes, at the very beginning, because of lack of uh, funds, I think the government could not uh, do. And uh, I could say that uh, during the early years of our stay there, when the society was not yet uh, uh, going into uh, progress, yeah. uh, I think the government had to uh, see to it that, uh, yeah, uh, some organizations, uh, NGOs, can take over the, the work. Mm -hmm. no? Your Excellency, um what would be other areas now that the church is expanding, or where would you say you would like to expand, in, especially in the area of social services? Because we have so many uh, social service uh, projects, mm -hmm. uh, we would like to uh, support, to go on with, with this uh, uh, social works, no? uh, because uh, we are also limited uh, with the finances to support them. Mm -hmm. As uh, maybe you know, uh, in Mongolia, we don't have any local income, so uh, we have to depend on uh, funding organizations or the congregations that we have to support our uh, projects. Yeah. We've been speaking a lot about the poverty, and yet at the same time, um, Mongolia's uh, economy over the last few years has been growing very rapidly. I think an average of 17% uh, over the last two years. And if I understand correctly, the skyline of the capital has, has changed dramatically with a lot of new high rises and a lot of new wealth. Mm -hmm. But from what I understand or from what I'm hearing from you, this, mm, this wealth is not trickling down to, to, the, other, to the lower levels of society. Uh, is, is this a reality? How do you see this question? Well, uh, a part of that uh, progress or increase of uh, uh, what I call this uh, material support uh, is already reaching the people, but uh, still very minimal. Uh, the, the progress uh, that is seen at the present time is uh, due to the uh, mining activities. There is a lot of mines, and um, investors from other countries are very busy with these uh, activities, like, for instance, Australia, Canada, and other countries. They are putting a lot of investment on this uh, 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 mining uh, industries, industries mm -hmm. uh, trying to uh, take copper, gold, uh, coal and then uh, uranium even okay. and other uh, precious stones from the earth. So especially. the potential for growth is, is extraordinary. Yes, mm. but then I just hope that uh, the, the profit of these uh, mining activities will also reach the people. Mm. In fact, like in the Philippines, in Mongolia, many of the uh, family members or at least one family member is abroad, a breadwinner, a breadwinner abroad, yeah. sending money back to, to the family at home. Yes, uh, I think that was uh, the trend in the past years. And the government, after uh, having all these activities, progress uh, being uh, done in Mongolia, the, the government would like to recall back the, the Mongolians who are working abroad, mm -hmm. because uh, there is already work to, to do in Mongolia. Your Excellency, with the relation with the government, there, is still, there are still some areas let's say, of concern or where there could be improvement. And one of the areas is missionaries, uh, specifically that there are still quotas on the number of missionaries allowed into the country. Can you tell us a little bit about the challenge of quotas on the number of missionaries and why is this still a problem? Uh, the government has a policy on uh, trying to restrict the number of uh, foreign missionaries or foreign workers at large. No? Uh, so uh, every year they have to make uh, a policy, uh, like this year it is 75-25, meaning that uh, for every 25 mi foreign missionaries or foreign workers, uh, we have to employ 75 uh, local people or Mongolians. No? So it is a challenge in a, in a way that, uh, yeah, we are many missionaries there already and we have to uh, to be, uh, if we have to be consistent, mm. uh, we have to increase the number of uh, our Mongolian workers. No, but uh, the problem is, 
uh, we don't have that much uh, money to, to to support salaries no okay so it is a challenge not only for us uh, Catholics but also for for other denominations. denominations yes so finance is a problem not only in terms yes. of the missionaries but what are the projects what would you say are your hopes what would be your greatest needs for the church in Mongolia uh, that you would perhaps like to to mention also for those who are with us today in our program yes in the last 22 years we have been putting up infrastructure of the Catholic Church like buildings and in churches and uh, so uh, with the very harsh uh, winters that we have mm -hmm. uh, our buildings also could not resist <laughs> no, uh, all those uh, severe winters though so they they grow old and they, they uh, are destroyed mm. or cracking mm. so there is a lot to to repair no? a lot of infrastructure yes mm. uh, infrastructures mm. so but anyhow uh, that's where we we are appealing to the yeah funding institutions and uh, to our benefactors to to support us mm. in this to carry out the work that we are doing especially on repairs of churches a good example is the the cathedral mm. So it's a very beautiful masterpiece uh, done by the Yugoslavs or Czechoslovakians yeah. uh, together with Mongolians, but uh, now it's leaking yeah. all over. And whenever I see this cathedral, I call it always uh, a crying room. When <laughs> because I enter, it's weeping yeah, so Because often. it's weeping, <laughs> dripping whenever <laughs> and the snow melts or mm. when there is uh, strong rain. So, but anyway, uh, if we need some help, it is to maintain, mm. support mm. our uh, present uh, engagements or commitments. Your Excellency, thank you for having been with us today in our program. It's a great pleasure to be here. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for having been with us today on our program, Where God Weeps. And if you'd like to know more about the situation of Catholics in Mongolia, or perhaps how you might be able to help Bishop Padilla in his efforts to grow the community, I would ask you to look at the contact information at the end of this program, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.